We're joined by Julie Cully, Manager of Sports Marketing at Brooks Running, and she will in turn introduce our speakers. Please join me in welcoming Julie Cully. I'm glad I decided to wear my Brooks shoes and not my dress shoes tonight, that call out. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Julie Cully, and I oversee our elite athlete programs at Brooks, as well as our youth programs. And tonight, I'm going to be talking a little bit about our Brooks Booster Club program, um, which gives scholarships and running gear to high school and cross-country programs across the U.S. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, I want to share my gratitude to all of you for coming to this event. Tonight, Brooks is matching each ticket purchase with a donation to the Brooks Booster Club program. So on behalf of runners across the US and those who have yet to be touched by our fabulous sport, thank you. Booster Club is especially near and dear to my heart because I know from experience how running as a kid can change your entire life. I started running in middle school at a middle school track meet and went on to run in high school, in college, and professionally for Team USA at the 2012 Olympic Games in London. <laughs> Thank you. Running is the thread that weaves through every part of my life. My husband, our business, owning and operating six running stores, as a college coach and now in my role at Brooks. It's a relationship you can have for your entire life and that is why it is so significant for kids. Brooks's commitment to the running community is one of the things that makes this brand so unique and that's in no small part thanks to our CEO, Jim Weber. One of the many things that makes Jim special is that Brooks's role in the running community is just as important to him as the product that we create. It makes complete sense that one of his first thoughts after writing this book was to dedicate the proceeds to the Brooks Booster Club. And so it is my pleasure tonight to introduce Jim to all of you so you can hear his story as well as the story of Brooks. Jim has led Brooks since 2001. His journey includes leadership roles for several consumer product brands, such as chairman and CEO of Sim Sports, president of O'Brien International, vice president of the Coleman Company, and various roles with the Pillsbury Company. He was also managing director of the US Bancorp Piper Jeffrey Seattle Investment Banking Practice and a commercial banking officer at Northwest Bank of Minneapolis, which is now Wells Fargo. Tonight, we are so honored to have John Richards joining Jim on stage. John is the morning show host and program director at KEXP, as well as the host of KEXP's Runcast, a podcast dedicated to inspiring runners. He has been an active runner since fifth grade, and he just ran a PR in Portland, so we might want to ask him about that. John owns Life on Mars, a bar on Capitol Hill. He co-hosts The Doctor and the DJ, a podcast with his wife, Dr. Amy Lindsay, and he has two boys and a dog named Susie. John, I actually have you beat. I have three boys and a dog named London. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Jim Weber and John Richards. Hi, everybody. They mentioned the PR, right? They got that? Okay. That's good. Uh, hey, how you doing? It's good to be here. Um, I'm just happy to be out in public and be able to do this uh, in person. I haven't been to town hall in quite a while uh, since the pandemic began, so I'm very excited to be here. And, and, you know, why am I here? I think it was explained a little bit in the intro. I've been a runner. I've been a loyal Brooks customer. When I um, did my first remote broadcast and my first marathon I had mentioned on the air because I was just scared to death. I, I said it on the air and I did this this thing at Bauhaus coffee up on the hill and a Brooks 
representative, of, I don't know who, came in and thanked me for talking about running and then hooked me up with gear and I've been wearing Brooks every run since. I've never worn anything else. So I think that's why I'm your, ba I'm your best customer. That's the reason. It worked. That's great. It worked, well, Jim. Um, and also, uh, Brooks has been really great working with our podcast and working to support all the stuff we do at KEXP. They get it. And it's not often that I really understand a sponsor to something we're doing. And Brooks has been amazing. So that's why I'm here. Jim's here because he wrote a book. So Welcome, everybody. <laughs> and I'm a DJ. I got asked a question about the music, which was awesome. And, well, I won't give it away in the book, but tell me about the, the playlist in the book, and, and was it what we were listening to here? It was, yeah. So um, I talk a little bit about it in the book, but music has always just sort of literally come through me, and my mother played Elvis and Johnny Cash and Hank Williams, and it was, there was always music in the house. And, uh, and then I have older brothers, so I fell in love with all my older brothers' music, starting with Beatles, The Stones, and, of course, Bob Dylan. So... Um, I can I can mark my life at every you know every stage and every milestone to the music that was um, in my ears at that time. So uh, and I can actually work to music, especially Bob Dylan. It's just it's always on. We have a Sonos system, and I think I use it every day. <laughs> so I gotta ask, what is your? I get this all the time. What's your favorite running song? What's your go-to? favorite running song. We didn't go over this ahead of time. This is, I'm putting you on. This is the war. I hate these questions, but it is, uh, I know my answer because I'm asking the question. So it's a weird, it, it, it's more of the energy of the song than it is the lyrics in this case. Tom Petty has a song, Listen to a Heart, and it's got a Rickenbacker opening riff on it that I am going to, when you open my casket, it's going to play that riff. <laughs> it's uh, Mike Campbell's Rickenbacker riff, and I, I just love the melody of that song. Every time that song comes on, I get faster. Mine's under pressure. Bowie, Queen, yes. I have slowed down my time at a race when that's come on because I want to listen to it and I know where it's coming. So speaking of, I got to ask about running, of course. You're like, when for you did it start? When, when did running become a thing for you? You know, I, I, um, in the book I talk about, I played hockey. I put everything I had into hockey. And my dad was 6'2". I'm 5'8". I thought I was going to be 6'2". <laughs> I just got slower every year. And, uh, and so when I quit playing competitively, I, I just had to do something. And the jogging boom was happening. This was 1979-80. You know, uh, Bill Bowerman wrote a book. Nike happened, right? And I had dolphin shorts. And I was, I was running and uh, it just became my thing. I, I, I came to love it. So in 1982, uh, the year I graduated from college, um, I ended up working for Pillsbury, but the first inaugural Twin Cities Marathon happened. And I just thought, why not? I literally signed up for the first one. I think there were 8,000 runners. And, uh, and that was just a progression of what I was doing. But I, I needed to run. I loved to run. And uh, it, was, it was absolutely mental therapy as much as anything else. Yeah, you said in the book you needed it like air and water. Yeah. It, you know, and I, I, I tell this story, but I process. And, uh, and I came to run for, you know, all the way through my life. I think 40 years, three to five days a week. And, and my go-to was a six-mile run on the weekends. And, and it, I call it a zen run. I called it ultimately a Dylan zen run um, <laughs> when I listen to music, which is about 30% of the time. But I just processed. And uh, it was therapy. It was great. Yeah, I've, uh, for me, I can, every hard point in my life, I've gone to running every time. And and. It's being, it's being alone and being in your environment and then ultimately with a group all at once. It's meditation yeah. in so many ways, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, and I try, to, I try to tell people, I, if you step outside of your house, you're a runner. You take two steps, you're a runner. That's, That's a what I love about it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so the book, you know, inspiration comes in many different forms. What was yours for this book? Was there a, was there a moment? Was there a, you talk about a person who said yeah. you should write this book. Well, you know, and I've, I talked a little bit about this in the book, but um, Mariel and I, for the first time, and it, it's something that should happen more often, but I'd taken two weeks off twice in my life. And Brooks has this little mini sabbatical program, so in 2015, we took four weeks, and I went off the grid. It was wonderful, but I wrote, I just said, I'm going to write every day. I wrote four hours every morning, 
and uh, and I it's it was a memoir basically, and I didn't think it'd become a book. Uh, I wrote about 80 pages, but I was really trying to unpack my hard wiring. And I thought at some point I'd share it with my boys, but then I set that aside. And all the while, Brooks is a great story. You know, we've got business case studies, and you know, I love to talk about Brooks. And we're on a journey, and it just gets better every year. We're really building a brand, we're, and it's culture-driven. It's just a fantastic team of people in a sport I love and a great industry. So, you know, as Brooks was developing, I'd, we'd, I've, I've often thought about telling that story because it's just a great business case study. It's a great brand story. It's a great turnaround. It's a challenger brand story in a world of these platforms and and dominant things. So, so I always knew there was a story there. And then, yeah, I had a. We were at the Olympic trials down in Atlanta. Fabulous, just a great event. February 2020, a month before uh, the pandemic took hold, and uh, Warren had invi invited me for a breakfast. So I came back through Omaha in February of 2020, and we finished a long conversation. He said, "Jim Brooks is a great story. You should write a book." So I did. Now, I, I, I just yeah. just to clear up which Warren this was. That was a green light to do it, and you know, it, uh, I I always thought it might happen, but yeah, but, but it took. I just decided. To yeah, Warren do Buffett's it. standing there telling you to do a book. Yeah, you do a book. Yeah, I did it. It wasn't an order. Or he anything. is my boss. Yeah, I was gonna say. Well, I also want to bring up you also uh, were isolated and decided you were gonna learn guitar. How did that go? Oh my gosh, <laughs> you know. And I brought I, a guitar. No, I. One of the things we do at Brooks when we get together in these diner rounds and we're having our sales meeting this week is we have a question at the table. Yeah. And one of the questions, you know, there's a lot of them, but, you know, if you could, if you could have do one other thing, what would you do? And I would love to be a front man. Oh, my God. You know, if I could only play guitar, uh, dream. And so along with uh, writing four hours a day, I took three guitar lessons a week for four weeks um, and it was really, really hard. So it, there's more dust on it than uh, there is play right now. Uh, you got 50% of your, your goals. Um, let's go back. I, I want to talk a little bit, because you and I have, have discussed, our childhoods have some similarities. You grew up in a, a house where alcoholism was, was there and mm -hmm. affected you. And Can you talk a little bit about how you talk about it in the book? I really appreciated it. I could, I could relate. Um, it, again, it came to the running part, too, and just... Yeah. Watching a parent destroy themselves like that, it's, it's a difficult thing. Yeah, and it was really tough because I had literally glass half empty and glass half full in my house. My mother was just an incredible spirit, gracious, generous, people-oriented, you know, social, 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 and her whole family was like that. And then my dad's side was more stoic and, and uh, so on and so forth. But my dad in particular, and I didn't know why until literally he was in his 80s because we never talked about it. But he, he was working at the family business, which is why I've never been in a family business, a <laughs> tavern, bowling alley, and, and restaurant. And alcohol was there every day. He started drinking at 9, and uh, he would have his last drink probably just at dinner or after every day until he had real severe health issues at 82. And that's all I ever knew. And, and unfortunately, uh, he was not in the place he wanted to be. His father had passed and a lot of debt and came into this business at age 23 and he spent his whole life there. And he was clearly bitter, he was unhappy. Um, and what happened at home is I just became scared to be around him. A lot of negative energy. I'd bring friends over and it would just be a, a verbal, screaming, crabby thing. And it was just a lot of negative energy. So. I attributed it to the alcohol, but I, I just think he's also in a place that he couldn't enjoy, didn't want to be, couldn't get out of, and I, I didn't know that till later, but and by fourth grade, I just, I, I'd been over to enough friends' houses to know that every family yeah. wasn't like mine, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so I spent as much time away from my house as I could. Have you been, I mean, in the book you do a bit, have you been able to look back and understand that disease and... and forgive him or, or understand what he was going through? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm married to a wonderful person, Mary Ellen, and, and often we would talk about it, and, and you have to try to understand where he's coming from, what his situation is. And, and so literally, um, two years before he died, I was back visiting. It was the first time ever. It was me, my mom, and my dad out for dinner. 
and I asked them their story, how they'd met, how they'd come to be, how they started their lives, and, and it all happened very fast. Six kids in eight years, and he jumped into this struggling business. So, so that was the backdrop to alcohol, yeah. um, but no one would go near uh, the alcohol issue with him. In fact, he'd yell and scream at anybody that did. So it never happened. No one ever challenged him on it. Well, walk us through, okay, you have like five minutes to do this, but walk us through your education into your professional career that kind of led you, not all the way to Brooks, but th there's a lot in the book about the path you took, which I found fascinating. Like most seventh graders, you were interested in running a brand. I know most <laughs> kids are like, I could play basketball or hockey, but I want a brand. <laughs> you I, stuck to that, man. I really did. I was a uh, dog with a bone. So I, seventh grade teacher, Mrs. McGrath, write about five careers, and you know, it really, um, it really opened my brain. So I wrote about, I wrote a couple pages on hockey, Bobby Hull was my hero, and he said that he had a side uh, task of you know, a small business because he needed a backup plan. So the second thing I wrote up about was running a company. I wanted to run a, a company someday. I knew I didn't want to own one, because I wanted to run as far away from the family business as I could, but, but that was number two. And so, you know, when the hockey thing started to fade, um, I started to pursue leadership and, and just knew I had to get an MBA. I don't know why, but it seemed like you had to do that. So, and I didn't have a lot of mentors that I talked to. I just watched people. And I was watching other people that had navigated, you know, success, at least that I could see. And so, you know, I, I just went after it. I was president of my class. I was president of fraternity. I went to Boy State. I, I did a lot of different things because I thought I had to do that. I had to get a good GMAT score. I had to get a decent GPA. And I had a lot of learning along the way. My college counselor in high school, first thing I said is I want to be an in, go to engineering school at the University of Minnesota. She literally laughed at me. She said, you can't do that. Your grades aren't good enough. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so, so, but I just started to, you know, jump in. I started off in banking because those were the only two offers I got. So I was a commercial banker and, and uh, but applied to B school and out of there, that's really the first opportunity they got. Pillsbury hired analysts in their corporate development area and after two years he went on into the business. So that was perfect. And, you know, I did some really fun stuff in their corporate office, assistant to the chairman, strategy work, a lot of M&A activity. Um, I tell some stories about my presentations there that were somewhat colorful. And then, you know, I got a chance to, to be a product manager. I was the product manager for Hungry Jack Honey Tasting Biscuits. That's a, that's a really exciting part and, of the book. And uh, Pillsbury yeah, Ready to Microwave Fudge Brownies. <laughs> yes. I told the boys I worked with the Doughboy. That's what I did every day. I went to work with the Doughboy. But I, I just had a wonderful experience there. Followed an executive, went to the Coleman Company, ended up running... Uh, one of their divisions transferred up here to Seattle, which I, you know, I chose in 1992 to run O'Brien Water Sports, which was part of Coleman, and uh, had fun with that. Went on to run a snowboard company. Uh, had an interim thing. I joined some boards, including Brooks at, at Piper Jaffray, doing the kind of work I'd done at Pillsbury. And then um, talked my way or convinced the board that I was an, an option at Brooks in 2001. So... Uh, now I've be able, been able to keep a job for more than three years. It's been wonderful. I know. What shocks my family is if I've been doing the same job for this many years. I'm sorry. What? That shocks my family that I've had a job this long. You know, that I had a job yes. in general. Yep. But yeah, yep. it shocks them. I don't know what your family feels about that. I, my mother once stuck said, to something. you're going to a water ski company. Is that big enough to be a business? Yeah. So, I think well, when I got to shoes, she felt better. Well, you, you, you came up in 91, the Coleman, and then you, the O'Brien deal. And they did, they do the water sports. And yep. now they're, the leader of that company was arrested for smuggling cocaine in the bindings. Yes. So and there's some local Seattle business so, folks here. So I got, I got a question and a follow up. Yep. Uh, what else brought you here to Seattle, if not just the job? And follow up, if Brooks is having trouble, will you put cocaine in the, in the shoes now that you have some experience. Only in Seattle. Let's hope this isn't nationally broadcast. Herb O'Brien, who is the founder of O'Brien Water Sports and HO, was um, arrested and convicted of smuggling cocaine underneath the bindings of water skis and went to prison, I think, for six years. How is this isn't a, a show on HBO? I have no idea. It's, and so it's an awesome story. everybody I introduced myself, I'm CEO at O'Brien, and our margins are really good. <laughs> 
Let's say they're really high. <laughs> Thank you. So what else about Seattle? I mean, you got here, and if the city, you know, wasn't for you, that you may not have come. I know the job, but you've stayed here. What was it when you got here in the early 90s? That so Marilyn and I grew up in Minnesota. We moved around a bit out east, and we were down in Phoenix running a division of Coleman. And we came to love Phoenix, actually, but it, the summers are tough. Yeah, yeah. Minnesota's tundra. <laughs> Phoenix is the desert. Now we're in the rainforest. But I was, I was on... Uh, I was at a restaurant on uh, Yarrow Bay Grill on Caroline Point in August on a sunny evening, and I called Mary Ellen at home. I said, we got to move up here. <laughs> this place is gorgeous. And then we moved into the woods, and it, we didn't see the sun for six months. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to people, well, when did you visit? Like, oh, August. Like, mm, mm-hmm. Good luck. You're in big trouble. Yeah. So you, you've been CEO for 20 years. Do you, do you still remember the, the moment? they asked you? I mean, this is what you've been going like forward for. This was your goal. Do you, do you remember that initial reaction when, when asked to be the CEO of Brooks? I, I do, and it was a process because I went on the board and Brooks was in trouble. Yeah. They'd, they'd lost a CEO. They'd lost another CEO. The bank, there was too much debt. The company was in trouble, and as a board member, we were talking about that all the time. So we started to move forward, and there was a board meeting where the chairman said, you ought to be in here running this, and we spent four months looking at it. But then I visited the partners of, of the private equity firm, Whitney, and, and I had great conversations with them. And the president said, you know what? This thing is a mess. We didn't know what we bought. It means too many things to too many people. It's probably going to take you five years, but you've got to pick a path and figure it out. And that was all I needed. Plus, they, they recapitalized the company. But that was, that was a huge, um, basically, mandate um, to, you know, to, to fix it and figure it out. So that, that was the moment where I knew um, I'm in. And it's failing, and now it's a billion-dollar brand. So you did all right. I mean, I think you turned it around. Like, what, what was it in those initial? It must have been hard in the beginning. Was it harder? I, I, the way I read your book was you were psyched. You were psyched to turn it around. You, you, had, you, you dove in. But what was it? What was the initial first few months or year like trying to turn a failing company around like that? You know, it was actually the fourth turnaround that I'd done. It was the fourth business that I ran and they're all sort of repositionings um, and you don't get hired into these things if there's kind of one small little problem usually it's it's complex and Brooks was that way but we saw an opportunity in running because the two shoes that were valued by runners and valued by retailers had good gross margins and there was something to build on there so we got rid of a lot of stuff that we were frankly losing money on and was tying up a lot of inventory, which was cash, and the company needed cash really badly. So, so we solved a whole bunch of things in that first year, but, but we also saw an opportunity um, to really focus on run, and the shoe that saved the company, and everybody at Brooks knows it, is the Adrenaline GTS. It just, it, that shoe literally saved the company, and it came, it was, it, it, the fourth version is the one that got it right, and that, was, that, that came in about a year after I got there, and, and that was critical. That was a, a stability shoe in the mid-price, frequent runner, everyday trainer. And if we got that one right, we knew we'd, we'd you know, be on our way to surviving. And that was job one. So but I think the idea that it could be a great brand, you, know, you, don't get to, you can dream about that, but you don't get to see that until you can survive and start to get literally um, some, some success underneath the basic core of the business. Well, and some of the takeaways, too, that I could apply to my own life were like three main things were the, was trust. You've got to trust this brand. It was to focus on the running. And I think even as a customer to Brooks, I realized that without realizing it worked, by the way. Because I, when I think running, I think, well, I'm going to go to Brooks. I'm not going to go to these other companies. It, it's sort of, you know, on the side. And the other is adapting. There's so many, you pivot and adapt so many times, and the company has so many times. Yeah. Um, I felt like there's some life lessons too there, not just for a company, but... Well, and I think the, the, the biggest challenge for me personally was gaining trust. And, and you think about that, we, were, we had lost trust kind of with everybody. <laughs> the bank was done with us. They wanted out. The investors were, you know, uh, catatonic. They were just kind of frozen. The employees were, you know, questioning everything because they'd heard it all before. The leadership team uh, had... I was the fourth person in two years, there literally was a pool on how long I would last. One of our biggest customers said, Jim, great, welcome, heard it all before, good luck to you. 
And then, you know, I think so it was, and that only comes from, you know, action and progress and, and uh, but I think we had to gain the trust of everybody, which is what happens in any organization, I think, because there's too many organizations today that you can solve for the owner, but that's not good enough anymore. Well, you talk about CEO trust in the book, too, and, and you want it partly, uh, why you wrote it was to tell the story of a CEO where it's a success story that, that, that most stories about CEOs, let's face it, are not good ones, and that there isn't trust there. And even in the book, I got, you know, again, you're talking to a nonprofit radio guy, but I was like, I couldn't keep track of which company owned who, and the Doughboy worked for uh, Berkshire, and I, I got lost somewhere along the way. And, and I can see that being an issue too. Like that, that's hard, it's hard to understand the value in companies eating other companies, and um, I, got, I got a little lost in there, but how is it to try to lead as a CEO and, and be trusted as one when there's such a, uh, not a great environment for CEOs? You know, I think th there's two pieces to that. I'll start with, you know, what I came into Brooks with. So after three companies in about, in about nine or ten years, I just wanted to play the long game because so much of it was private equity or, you know, fixing something getting it, getting, realizing some core value, and then the investors would sell it, and they'd go on. That's what happened to me three times. So at Brooks, I knew it was going to be sold, but I decided I was going to play through. I was going to stay and, and be there through that next donor, which allowed you to look down the field and play the long game. So that was that. But I think the other issue, and, and I opened up a dialogue with Warren Buffett around it. I sent him a letter. The degradation of trust in institutions and government and religion and leaders of every sort um, across society is it's so clear to everyone and I really wanted to understand that better. You know, I, I was born in 1960 and, and the country was a different place at that time, not for everyone, but, um, but it just seemed like the institutions were stronger. So, you know, it feels like it's, there's a lot that has changed over time and I think it's a big issue. I mean, the biggest, biggest challenge any leader has is, is developing trust with the people that really matter to your mission. So, you know, all of the above. But I think the, the cool thing we've been able to do at Brooks and Berkshire Hathaway is a key part of that is we're playing the long game. We've, I've had four owners at Brooks, and we've played through each one. So in the book, too, um, you have these leadership principles, six, I believe, that yeah. it, start with four, I believe, yeah. it just sort of grew. Which, you don't have to go over them all if you don't want to. But I thought they were, I, I loved what you wrote about that. Yeah. And they come up many times in the book. Can you tell me which one's like the most profound? Yeah. There's one in particular. So I think it, you know, they really sort of reflect my journey as a person and, and as a leader. So the first four are really what you need to do in your business. You know, your moat and your niche and, and profitability and, and uh, execution and all that. And that's what I came into Brooks with. By the time, you know, I'd run three businesses, I knew those things were going to be super important. So that was what I built the whole thing on. But my growth um, over the next decade was real. And I added the fifth one really after about 2009, 2010 is to lead authentically because I had my head so down and I think I had, I, I wasn't awful as a leader, but I just assumed everybody thought like I did, and it was a huge revelation to me to understand that that actually wasn't true. So, you know, creating a more empathetic, um, you know, open mind and deep listening and all that, leading authentically, I think, was the, was the opener for me. And that was only in the last 10 to 15 years, which is a bit embarrassing to say, but it's true. Um, and that growth happened while I was in that first decade at Brooks. So part of uh, Brooks is giving back. It was mentioned before we came out here. It's important to you. It's important to the company. It's one thing I love about Brooks. Can you tell me about, like, maybe, the? I mean, we all want to give back, but what's the thought when Brooks is giving back? And do you have a, something you're the most proud of or something you, you supported? You, I read about the Special Olympics here in Seattle. Um, yeah, tell me about that. You know, I think that it's interesting at Brooks because I don't own Brooks, and all of us at, on the team, we don't own it. We're stewards of the brand, and, you know, and that's why I think we're such a great fit with Berkshire because they're just a, a fantastic owner for us. So you know, what we know we need to do is fully engage um, in the running community and fully engage in the communities we operate in. And so you know, we've committed ourselves to really give back into the sport, hopefully grow the sport, 
include and bring pe more people into the sport. Um, and so Julie mentioned the booster club. That's my personal favorite because we go into, you know, what's being cut at schools is often PE and sports and, you know, football and basketball might get funded, but track and field and cross country don't, and there are no cut sports. So, you know, we've been able to, to you know, sort of reinvest in the sport and give back to these fabulous coaches that are literally coming out of their own pocket using their own cars to, you know, bring these kids into the program and, and, uh, and sport's such a powerful thing in people's lives. So, wow, you know, we've, I think we put about $5 million into these needy programs and, you know, I'd like to put three times as much because running can change yeah. your life. Yeah. It really can. Yeah. And, it's, and there's some coaches that have gotten kids. They've literally recruited kids for the cross-country team out of gangs. Yeah. They've gotten them out of gangs and brought them into this program, and it's changed these kids' lives. You know, when I was, I don't know, fifth grade is when I always say I started running because I had a teacher, Mr. Guest. I mean, he, he pulled me aside. He's like, you're always running. You're running in the hallways. You're running in the... You should do cross country. Yeah. And, and, I, and I remember that he also, I know, was supporting it with his... I, I know, I look back and think yeah. like, how did we have gear and stuff? I think it was him, but it, he changed my life. And it kept me, it kept people like me busy too, I realized. You want to keep us busy. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want a bunch of bored kids running around Spokane. You want them running on a track because <laughs> I'm only going to get in trouble. Plus, if the police came, I could run really fast. That was the other thing that I learned. Um, I, I, <laughs> I wrote some notes because I don't want to miss any questions, and I, I realized I wrote one. It just says, pandemic, what the fuck? It's right there. Um, <laughs> so, so pandemic, yeah. it's in your book. Yeah. It's hard to see. It. I, I, um, <laughs> when, I, when there's a show on or something, and they're going through like a documentary, and they're going through the years of the pandemic, it's almost hard to, the early part of the pandemic. And I like what you wrote about it and, your, and, the, and the company's journey through that. Can you talk about how you all adjusted? You know, it's interesting because we've all been through it. So everybody has an experience on it and every business person has, could literally write a book on how the, you know, right. the business had to navigate the pandemic. Um, you know, I felt very fortunate in this sense that we were ready for it. We'd sort of been battle tested. We had some self-inflicted challenges that we had in earlier in the earlier year on a, on a distribution center and our culture was strong, our leadership team was strong. So in the, comes the pandemic, 90% of our shoes are sold through stores in Europe and here. And in 30 days, as we all know, every store shut down. And we had 300 million on the of product coming in and we thought, you know, what is the chance of these retailers don't make it? We sell through a lot of small retailers and sporting goods they might go out of business. Nobody knew, right? We didn't know how lethal it was, how transmissible. So it was white knuckle time. And, uh, you know, and then Berkshire came out, and I don't know what they were seeing and hearing, but they said, it'd really be good if you could live off your own balance sheet. If you really need us, let us know. And, and that got real because now we had to, we, we just had to get through it. First step is to survive. So just fantastic leadership started with, you know, our European uh, leader, Matt Dodge who he saw it earlier because the stores over there closed first and we created this phased um, outlook a hypothesis of what we thought would happen and we thought running could possibly make the cut. We'd seen it happen in the Great Recession. So um, we put together this plan and we had our, our field marketing people literally going to parks, counting runners at four o'clock every day <laughs> to see if more people were gonna be running. Strava data was incredible. Strava data went, went just like that. As, as everything closed down, you could see that people were getting outside, moving, walking, hiking, running. So, you know, in about six to eight weeks in, we talked to Greg Abel and the Berkshire people, and they said, follow your customer. So we didn't lay off one person. We were having weekly town halls. That's not easy, weekly global town halls. And we didn't have answers. So we just got on and talked about what we were doing and how we, what we were watching and everything else. But we were so fortunate because we could see people running and then they were shopping for gear online. So yeah. it went from 60% in stores to 80% online. And our sales in May were above 2019. That's how fast running happened. So we turned back on our supply chain and we, we felt super fortunate. But I think, you know, we really kept our people with us all the way through on, on those town halls as hard as they were to do. And, uh, and then, you know, we, I think we were on it faster than anybody else because we only focus on runners. That's the advantage we have against the other brands. Your customers are so much more complex. And with retailers closed, you just, you hold. Yeah. 
you just hold and maybe lay off. And so many people, you know, the first job is to survive, so a lot of companies laid off people. And we'd worked so hard to build this team and recruit in a very challenging marketplace. There's not one employee we wanted to lose. So um, we're pretty fortunate that running made the cut, but I think um, this team navigated it really well. And I'm sure you saw even more runners when, when races started again. Like for yeah. me, I, I went out, in Portland was a res, why I got my best time, because I was just an idiot out there, I, I just running as fast as I can. I was so excited to be around people. But I remember walking out and crying when the gun went off. And I, yeah. I tend to be emotional when I run, but at, at those moments, man, that was... Yeah. It's like, maybe we're back. Have you yeah. seen? Absolutely. I'm sure. It, it, running, is, running has been, it's, we believe it's in a secular growth trend yeah. now because it's sticky. I think we saw that in the recession, 2009, a lot of people took it up and they stuck with it. Yeah. So we think um, we're going to see great growth and just people getting outdoors. And the, and the one thing about the pandemic that was true for many, many people is it just created more awareness around health and wellness and moving. Well, you talk about the town halls and, and the employees at Brooks, and, and it's an amazing group of people. Talk a little bit about the culture of, of the company, why that's so important, especially now. You know, there's remote working, there's people working, I'm sure, in-house now. Yep. How does culture play into all that for Brooks? You know, it, it's interesting, and it's one of the reasons, you know, I think you, I wanted to tell a story in this book about Brooks because... The culture's always been there, and I think it comes from the 90s when our product was mediocre, but the people were, were passionate and energetic, and we literally were in that humble mode where we just serviced the heck out of retailers, trying to get them to try our shoes and, and, and give it a whirl, and as the product got better, when I joined the company, one of our biggest customers said, Jim, there's something special about that company. This is 2001. When I walked, he goes, he was the biggest buyer of running shoes probably in the world, Nike, everybody. But Brooks, there's something about that company when you walk through the doors, the people are glass half full. They're, they're positive. Don't lose that. And I think, I think it's always been there. And we've challenged ourselves not to lose that. And now to scale it at a billion dollars, which I always thought in our industry, the leading company is approaching 50 billion in revenue. That our, If our culture isn't strong at a billion, we're going we're gonna to be in trouble. So we've worked really hard on it. Um, we've, we've really engaged our leadership team to lead values you know, culture is behaviors in action, right? And and it's really not, it's not a thing. It's people and how they behave. So we're really trying to lead, you know, against these values and competencies that are really Brooks at their best. It's not an accident. You know, we've been working on it for five years and trying to scale it. And, uh, and, and you know, it, it goes day by day, but we're, we're doing it. We're pretty proud of it at this point. Well, I read throughout the book about, you know, how positive you were and half glass full and live life to its fullest and life is short. And um, I love that outlook. I found it inspiring and it, you know, it, it goes right into the part of the book where you talk about your cancer. Can you talk about what that's done with your, your life outlook? I mean, in the book, it felt like it got even stronger. It, it, you know, it's one of those things and it's like companies hitting challenges and when people hit challenges, I think you really get a sense of of where you are at your core, you know, what, where, where you are in your life, where you are at your core. And it's, it's one of those things where that's a milestone where you get to make choices. And, and now, you know, how many days you have left, you don't really know, but you know, it sort of all comes there. What, where do you want to be? What do you want to be doing? And, and uh, the, one of the things that was so clear to me, you know, so I got diagnosed with uh, esophageal cancer, December 7th, 2017. Something like that. I'm sure, anyway, some people in the room know. Five years, and uh, and the the first couple days are are just a shock, right? Because you know I talk about every time somebody gets cancer, I go to the web, and whatever it is, learn more about it. You know, treatments, how serious is it? And they always said that five year survival rate, and and mine was twenty percent according to the web, which isn't great. Um, so you know, but I I think personally for me, I just didn't want to be the cancer person. I didn't want to throw everything away and think about what I had to lose and live uh, about, you know, what I, what I wasn't going to have. I just didn't want to go there at all. I, and part of that, I think, was, you know, what I grew up with. I sort of ran from negativity. And so I just, I wanted to get the most out of every day. But it was clearly, um, you know, tough on my wife and my kids. And, and you want to be there to see your grandkids. So that's what led me to just, I'm going to fight this thing, and I'm going to do everything I can to beat it, 
But, to, you know, still to this day, I figured out that I'm living my life the way I want to. I'm doing all the things I want to do. Uh, I'm around the people I want to do it with. And so the idea of punching it, punting it all and, you know, traveling or golf. Everybody out here knows I suck at golf. I'm terrible. So, um, so I just decided I was doing exactly what I was doing and, and what I wanted to do. And so fight it, try to get healthy, and I don't recommend it. It's a long journey. How you doing? I'm good. I was telling some folks earlier, you know, it's, it's five years this November, so the good news is I think the cancer's gone. I don't think about it at all, really, now and then, but I think it's gone. And uh, I've got an annual scan now. I'll do a scan, but I, you know, I had complications on the first surgery, so, you know, I have a, I have a Frankenstein digestive system, which mostly works. Um, sometimes it doesn't. And then I, I, uh, my left diaphragm was paralyzed in, in uh, the surgery, and I had another you know, surgery to repair that. So let's just say my lung capacity isn't great. So the, the biggest loss of this whole thing is, is really not being able to sustain a running heart rate. So you know, I really miss long runs. I can walk run, I can do treadmill intervals, and bike. I can do a lot. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so take what you get, but man, do I miss a long run. <laughs> I bet. You know, I know this isn't, your book is not a love story, but it kept coming up a little bit as a love story and your wife all these years, I couldn't help but feel that in the way you wrote about her and, and where she shows up and the support. Can you talk about her for a second and, and, and how she shows up in the book for you? So uh, we're having our 40th anniversary on June 12th next uh, month. Congratulations. Next that month. That deserves some applause. And uh, That you remembered. That's why you deserve it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we got a trip planned. So. Okay, good. All right. But I, you know, we've been, we've been, I call it dating now for 44 wow. years, and, and we, we, we became best friends. And as Mary Ellen often says, you know, we, we really did grow up together. We really did, and... And so it's just been a journey all the way through, and, and uh, I think we've both grown. Um, but, you know, that's life, right? How good does it get? And so um, just been fabulous to have her by my side. And I think, you know, going through something like cancer, um, wow, yeah. grateful. Mary Ellen got me through it oh, all the way. That's great. For besides love in this book and, and your story, what are you hoping people, when they read this book, will get out of this? What, what, what is your hope you know I think um, I've worked really hard um, to be good at what I do um, and that was my singular focus I, I had that early on in my life because I didn't feel like I was that I, I, I try to be good at hockey but I, I really am a believer in Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours I just thought if I'm going to be good at something I'm going to have to really focus on it and I'm really proud of what we've accomplished at Brooks. So as a, it's a business case study, I, I just think it's a great challenger brand story and I'd love to share it and, and you know, hopefully people learn from that and other business people, other brands that aren't the big platform leading dominant thing, you know, can, can look at our, our playbook and what we've done and, and maybe be encouraged by their opportunities with it. And then just the whole, you know, culture and people side of what we've done, which, you know, again, I've grown with it, but, you know, I think what we're doing, the, the sustenance of this brand will be from its people. And, you know, if somebody asked me, you know, what, what legacy I might have at Brooks, it's, it's got to be the culture because we, I'm so proud of our products. I'm so proud of the work we do for our customers, our marketing and everything else, service, the team just executes so well for the customer. But the truth is what will sustain Brooks is, is the people. And so um, that's just super cool. And, and because of our ownership framework, we, we, get to be, we get to lead the culture. We get to own you know, the whole thing, including developing the culture around Brooks. So that's really exciting. And it's complicated to understand, but, um, you know, what the, what the outcome is, I think, in our industry is is uh, remarkable and I think well-known. Uh, there was one more thing. I, I forget, it's the ending of your book. I was surprised. Um, and I thought it was amazing. Like, you step out and start talking about a world you'd like to see and the responsibility you have, Brooks has, that other companies have, that we as humans have. And it, it's 
almost controversial to step, <laughs> have an yeah. opinion about these things, which is weird to me, but you really step into it and, and talk about a world you want to see. I, I love the ending of your book. I, I felt even more inspired seeing that that's how you view the world and how you'd like to see it. You know, I think um, I, um, I'm, I tend to be a systems thinker and now things are so, everything's politicized, which is so sad in so many ways. And, you know, somebody that read the book already has said, and then you got political in that chip. <laughs> yeah, it, for me, it has nothing to do with yeah. politics. It has to do with our culture, our system, our civic society, how we treat each other, and our economy that, you know, over time, in my lifetime, you know, in 1960, the year I was born, the, the minimum wage was a living wage. A family of four could own a house, send their kids to college you know, had a pension, all these things. And the, the economy has changed dramatically in my lifetime. And it doesn't have to, you know, it didn't have to change that way. And those are choices for us. And so what I tried to talk about in there are just, are just choices for us in our economy, which I know a bit about. Um, and obviously, um, you know, putting the, putting the, the team hat on um, and trying to make this a better country for everybody. I, I think the only path forward is we got to include everybody. Um, boy, that's going to take a generation, right? It's not going to happen overnight, but um, those are things that, that, you know, I believe and have just been part of my own experience, and, um, I, you know, I wanted to share it. Did you, did you plan on writing that, or what, were you like... Did I what? Did you plan on that? Was like, this is how I'm ending the book. Or were you just really pissed one day and said, this is how I'm finishing this book? Or I'm finished with this book. I need well, to go back and write some stuff. I've, you know, I've just, I've watched it literally over yeah. decades. So the antitrust thing and income inequality, I just see it. Yeah. And we're a brand that, you know, sells kind of the middle class and the middle class isn't done well in the last mm -hmm. 30 years. But you have to look at it over decades. And, and uh, yeah, I think a lot of people said, that chapter, you know, you could leave that out. I bet and, they uh, did. <laughs> and it didn't need to be there. But it's, you know, I grew up uh, in the Midwest and it's, it's, it's hard to describe, but um, you kind of have the team hat on yeah. there. And, and that's, that's, you know, that's how I, I look at the world. Well, I've given away the whole book. You don't need to buy it now. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Um, I hope you send in questions. Um, did you send in questions? Let's see if we make this work. This is the Q&A part. Okay, here we go. Write your, okay. Um, let's see. I like this one. Can you talk about the decision to close down the majority of the market and focus on elite runners? It is a much smaller market. Um, so when, when, when it came to Brooks, Athletic Footwear and Apparel, and all of you know the brands, and they all play, for the most part, across categories, basketball, court shoes, and then good, better, best pricing, and that was Brooks. All the athletic brands have played kind of the whole field and all the price points. And when we got to Brooks, that was a failing strategy for us because we were number seven or eight or nine at everything. So really, you know, in one sense, it looks, you know, um, visionary. But the truth of the matter was we didn't have any choices. Mm. At a, you know, just to survive, you know, the only, brand, the only products that were making money were the running products and that were actually pieces of equipment that runners appreciated. So in that sense, it was simple. But I had been in the equipment business. I had been in... O'Brien water sports, all the stuff you can do behind a boat, snowboards. And, and so, you know, the first opportunity I saw, especially when Nike was doing shocks and air and ASICs was a great product, but it had all this visible technology. We didn't have any of that, but we were going to treat it like a piece of gear. And we knew that the frequent runner, you know, the key was to get the second shoe sale. So it wasn't just elites. It was people that were putting a lot of mileage in that, that actually needed good product. Um, and uh, so if you're putting 20 miles a week in, and we built a shoe that really rode well, was balanced, fit well, according to runner's world, you know, fit, stability, quality, durability was a lot more important than, you know, aesthetics and all of that. So we, we just went at those functional attributes, treated it like a piece of equipment, and tried to get that second shoe after a good experience. And that's the magic of the running category, because people get loyal to their shoe. So, oh, yeah. My, yeah, I had done. I was, it was like, that simple. Yeah, my feet didn't hurt yeah. after I ran a race. I was like, yeah. I should get these shoes again. So it worked. Um, I was going to ask this too, and I love Run Happy. That always, well, makes me happy. But um, what does it mean to you when you hear Run Happy? 
You know, Run Happy is interesting because it was it predated me. It, yeah. it was a campaign that was launched, you know, maybe a year or two before I got there. And we, we, we felt the product had to match sort of that promise, so we really worked hard on product. But in essence, it was celebrating your run. You know, all the work we, we, we did early on, you know, everybody knows uh, the swoosh, powerful brand. You don't win silver, you lose gold. It's about epic athletic achievement. One of the greatest brands ever built. Everybody that's played a sport gets it. But running is unique because it's a phenomenal sport. Julie Cully talked about it. Uh, maybe the original sport, um, road racing and track and field and cross country and now ultras and trail and everything, Olympics, right? It's just powerful, but what makes running unique is it transcends sport because it becomes an investment in yourself. It becomes health, wellness, mental therapy, and that's what Brooks saw in Run Happy. No one else was doing that. We basically were gonna we're gonna anchor in the soul of running, which is the sport, but we were gonna celebrate everybody's run, whether it was your 10th marathon or your first 5K, it was about you and your run, and that was run happy. It wasn't about, you know, the, the person who broke the tape in right. the marathon. It was about you and your run, and that was really unique at that time, and, and wow, look how running has developed. That's the core of the marketplace, and so we're involved in the sport. We celebrate the sport and inspires, but we're really trying to connect with you and your run. Very different. That's what run happy is. Yeah, my, I, like when my younger younger one is getting older, I don't get sad about him figuring out there's no way the Easter Bunny gets into this house and breaks through. I, I worry that because every time I do a race, I come home with a medal and he thinks I won. And and every time I say, yeah, totally won. Because I mean, technically I did, right? Like I won my race. And he's all happy. And he's, so now he's going to go start racing. He's like, well, I'm going to win. I'm like, oh, shit. Uh, so if you run a race, everybody gets a medal. You got to get out there. That's where it started. Awesome. I got a participation medal every time. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, uh, we're almost out of time, but these questions are around the same thing. It's the most kind of surprising thing you've encountered about being CEO. What's the hardest thing you've been through at Brooks? And what is the thing that keeps you up at night? That is all very... Like, man, what is the bad stuff you're dealing with? What's That's a lot. Tell us right now. You know, I, 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 my team knows this. We've been through a lot of challenges, and, and it's about navigating them. Now, how many things do you control in business today, right? It's, it's the disruption of the year every year, it seems. But I think the hardest part for us when, when the, the consumer and the market changed a lot, millennials in 2015, where the demand just kind of falls down. Then you've got to resolve for the customer, and, and that was a hard time. And it wasn't just us. It was the whole industry. But uh, that was a very difficult time, and, and you know the lights are not bright. You have to make a call, and we did, and, and we anchored in performance, and we've doubled our business since 2017. But that was a lonely time. You know, our it was a lonely time, and, and you have to have courage in those moments, and, and the team has to kind of lock arms and go. But you know, every business has those challenges. That was, for me, the toughest puzzle. Well, um we talked before, I, I was asked to talk at, at Brooks during the pandemic, and we talked about running and mental health, and it's near and dear to my heart. Um, but during that, we had talked about that I, I have done a, I've done a show or a concert on top of the Space Needle, on top of the Pike Place Market, and Brooks' roof was brought up, and I still owe you that. Because yes. some of your employees are like, well, okay, well, we got to do that when the pandemic's so I'm like, uh-oh. So We're going to do it, Chun. I'm putting him on the spot, because I'm in if you're in. We're in. I think nothing better than that view. I've been up on the roof. It's amazing. Great. We get some music up there, and we bring all, like you and I both know, music, community, running are what makes this life worth living. So if we can do that all there, I'm, I'm in. We're doing it. Thanks, okay. John. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody at Brooks and everybody here at Town Hall, and you're going to be out with your book in the lobby signing some books. Yep. Make sure you go in there and get a book and, uh, and talk to Jim. And um, thank you all for coming tonight. Thanks, and, everybody. Yeah. See you outside.